What's up, biology students? Mr. Holloway here. Today we're going to learn a bit about cells, and this theory called cell theory, which explains how these things called cells are related to the bigger picture of life as we know it. According to cell theory, all living things are composed of cells, every single one. We can even determine what kind of life form we are dealing with by looking only at its cells. Here we see an example using three of the most basic cell types, bacterial cells, animal cells, and plant cells. As you can see, some of these are more similar than others, and we can further classify these cells into two even more basic categories, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. This cell, the bacterial cell, is a prokaryote, and here we see some of the defining features of prokaryotic cells. They are smaller in size than eukaryotic cells, they reproduce asexually, they lack internal membranes, and therefore have no cellular organelles. Consequently, they have no nucleus, and therefore their DNA is free-floating inside the cell. Although some prokaryotes live as colonies of cells, all prokaryotes are unicellular, meaning that every prokaryotic organism is composed only of a single living cell. These two cells, the plant and animal cells, are eukaryotic cells. As you can see, there are some differences between plant and animal cells, but overall they are far more similar to one another than either one is to a prokaryotic cell. Not all eukaryotes are multicellular, but many of them are, and many of them reproduce sexually. Some eukaryotes reproduce asexually, and some kinds are even able to reproduce in both fashions. Eukaryotic cells are bigger than prokaryotic cells, and eukaryotes also have membrane-bound organelles. That's what all of these little structures are. And they also have a cell nucleus that protects the cell's genetic information. So all living things are made of cells, sometimes as few as one cell, and sometimes with many, many trillions of cells. Here we see a few examples of real-life plant cells. As you can tell, cells, even plant cells, come in many different varieties. But all plant cells share certain fundamental similarities, whether they are rapidly growing root cells, or the cells that protect the pores in a leaf and close to prevent water loss when the conditions are too dry. We can tell they are eukaryotic cells because each contains a nucleus, and we can tell that they are plant cells because of the thick, rigid cell walls and large central vacuoles. These green structures are also where photosynthesis occurs, and that too can tell us that some of these are plant cells. But not all plant cells photosynthesize, so not all plant cells have these structures. Animal cells, on the other hand, appear quite a bit differently. Here we see muscle cells, and red and white blood cells, and some cheek and skin cells. And these are also eukaryotic, but unlike plant cells, they do not have cell walls, only a cell membrane, and they do not have a large central vacuole. This one here isn't really an animal, but it's not really a plant either. It's a single-celled organism called an amoeba. Unlike muscle cells or blood cells, which on their own don't really constitute a whole organism, this amoeba lives as just one cell, and that one cell is able to perform all of the basic functions of life. We don't get much of an opportunity to learn about fungi in this class, but fungi are also eukaryotes, and like all living organisms, they are also made of cells. Fungal cells are distinct in their own way, often very long and narrow, and many of them contain multiple nuclei. But they are actually more similar to animal cells than they are to plant cells, even though some fungi look and behave more like plants on a superficial level. They also play a very important role as decomposers in almost every ecosystem, and scientists are researching ways that fungi might be used to remediate environmental damage, say, from an oil spill or some other kind of soil contamination. And then there's the invisible part of our biosphere, the microorganisms among us that we do not see unless we look for them through a powerful microscope. Bacteria and other microscopic organisms are literally everywhere, even inside of us in our guts helping us to break down food. And they are also made of cells. Much smaller, much simpler cells, but cells nonetheless. Because all living organisms, from bacteria to baboons, are made of cells. Cell theory also states that cells are the basic units of structure and function in living things. Basically, this means that cells are the smallest units of life, because they perform all of the basic functions of life like taking in nutrients and transforming energy, metabolizing molecules, and getting rid of waste. Cells even reproduce and grow and develop over time. But the smaller parts that make up a cell, molecules, organelles, and what have you, do not perform all of these functions on their own. So, cells are alive because they perform all of the basic functions of life. 
but the parts that make up a cell are not alive because on their own they don't perform all of these functions. Here we see a few of these basic units of life. Muscle cells and neurons, or nerve cells. Each of these basic units performs all of the functions of life, and a single muscle cell can do everything that any other muscle cell can do, just like a nerve cell can do everything that any other nerve cell can do. But you put one muscle cell or one nerve cell together with a lot of other cells like it, and you start to build complex structures that are capable of much, much more complicated functions. We've also got some basic units of plant life here, too. In this case, these basic units of life that we call cells have arranged themselves into a leaf, each one performing all of the basic functions of life, and each also specialized to do a particular job inside the plant, much like our muscle cells are specialized to do certain jobs inside of our bodies. Cell theory also tells us that new cells are produced from existing cells. Before the microscope was invented, there was this idea called spontaneous generation that said that some organisms spontaneously generated or suddenly appeared out of nowhere if the conditions were right. For example, if you left meat out on the counter, maggots would suddenly appear out of nowhere several days later. If you left bread out, mold would suddenly appear. What proponents of spontaneous generation didn't see were the fly eggs that had been laid on the meat and the mold spores that had fallen onto the bread. The eggs hatched, and that's where the maggots came from, and the spores grew into the mold that consumed the bread. These living organisms, made of cells, came from other living organisms who were also made of cells, who reproduced to make new individuals based on their own cells and their own genetics. Cells are capable of replicating themselves. On a basic level, this is what we call asexual reproduction, that is, reproduction by way of cell division only, and not based on the combination of cells and genes from two separate organisms of the same species. Prokaryotic cells divide by binary fission, literally splitting one cell into two. Eukaryotic cells divide by way of mitosis, which is the division of the nucleus, and cytokinesis, which is the division of the cell's cytoplasm. It is in one of these two ways that cells are capable of reproducing themselves to make new cells. Suffice it to say that wherever the first cells came from, according to cell theory, all other cells in existence today were produced by previous generations of cells, all the way back as far as we can go. In our own life, if we go back far enough, we find a single cell, much like the one generic animal cell we saw at the very beginning of this video. If we go back just a bit further, we would find that this one cell was created from the fusion of two different cells, one egg cell and one sperm cell, each containing half the DNA necessary to build a complete human being. These two cells fuse to form one cell that we call a zygote, and this is the cell on day zero of our existence. No heart, no brain, no organs or organ systems, just one cell. That cell divides to form two cells. Those two cells each divide to form four cells, then eight, then sixteen, and so on, over and over and over again. Eventually, these cells begin to specialize and take on specific jobs. They begin to organize themselves into organs and organ systems, and those organ systems slowly come online and begin to function. All the cells that make up our body today originated from that one cell, because all new cells are produced from existing cells. This idea that we've been talking about, like plate tectonics and like gravity, is a scientific theory, and it's worth coming back to the idea of what exactly a scientific theory is before we go any further. Theories are powerful explanatory tools in science. They help us explain a wide variety of observable phenomena and are supported by a large body of evidence. Theories help us to make predictions about new situations, and when our predictions fail, we make revisions to our theory to account for new evidence whenever it becomes available. Cell theory is a great example. Cell theory helps us to explain what cells are and where they come from, and how they relate to the bigger picture of life and what it means to be alive. This theory helps us to explain where each of the trillions of cells in our body came from, as well as how the cells in our body are similar to the cells of other organisms, both closely and distantly related to us. Cell theory is supported by all the evidence we have available to us and informs our understanding of things like medicine and medical science because as we find new ways to prevent and treat disease, we do so under the assumption that we are all cellular organisms. Theories, though, are often misrepresented. All too often, people will use the word theory when they mean hunch or educated guess. But theories are far more than that. 
Theories are often portrayed as being somehow less important and less robust and less meaningful than scientific laws, but this is also not the case. In science, theories and laws are different and serve different purposes in the scientific process, but they are equally important in their own way. Likewise, theories do not become laws. Cell theory will never become cell law. But that doesn't mean that cell theory is somehow less valuable or less important than, for example, Newton's laws. So when you hear someone attempt to discredit a scientific idea by saying that it is just a theory, remember, the idea that we are all living things made of cells is also just a theory, one supported by every piece of evidence that we have available to us at this time. In a big way, this theory started with the microscope, invented by a guy named Robert Hooke back in the 17th century. This device, which bears little resemblance to the high-tech microscopes we have today, opened a whole new world to scientists and helped us discover what life is really made of. Other scientists, like Leeuwenhoek, improved upon Robert Hooke's original design, and the field of microbiology began to grow. Scientists like Leeuwenhoek documented their work carefully in writing and in drawings, and their discoveries became the knowledge upon which future scientists would base their work. Leeuwenhoek, for example, examined the cellular structure of many plants and animals and was the first to observe and describe what we now call microorganisms, living creatures too small to see with the naked eye. Still other scientists, like the German scientists Schwann and Schleiden, contributed to cell theory by contributing their observations about plant cells and embryos to the greater body of knowledge that was developing at the time. It was these two scientists who proposed the first version of cell theory, but it is important to note that their work built upon the work of many other scientists, and their work was continued by many other scientists as well, who contributed even more to our understanding of the cellular basis of life. The original version of cell theory contained the three points we've already discussed. That all living things are made of cells, that cells are the basic units of structure and function in living things, and that all cells arise from other cells. But modern cell theory goes farther still. Modern cell theory also states that the activity of an organism depends on the activity of all the individual cells that make that organism. Basically, this means that what an organism is capable of doing depends on what that organism's cells are capable of doing. Energy transformations due to metabolism and biochemistry occur within cells. Molecules are built and broken down, absorbing and releasing energy within cells. We've learned quite a bit about this in our last unit on biochemistry. Cells contain hereditary genetic information that is passed from cell to cell during division. This refers to DNA, the universal genetic code of life. And in organisms of similar species, all cells are basically the same in their chemical composition. This means that humans have cells that are chemically similar to other humans, and that pine trees have cells that are chemically similar to other pine trees. To understand life, we have to understand what life is made of, and all life is cellular. Prokaryotes and eukaryotes, bacteria and baboons, they are all made of cells, and those cells can reproduce to make more cells, and those cells perform vital functions that keep the organism alive. And with that, I'll bring our video to a close. Thanks for watching, and remember that you can go back and watch this video as many times as you need to until you understand what cell theory is all about.